like in India, the roof too. Oh, that's nice. Uh, where in India? Uh, Mumbai, basic Tata power. Oh, okay. I'm from the south, so not uh, really, really close, but it's still nice, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think I should start in around like, yeah, I should start now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Druen, and I'm a year 12 student at Canberra College and the moderator of this program. I welcome you to the BLOF lecture series. BLOF is an acronym for biodepletion, lost, unknown, and forgotten fauna. Before proceeding any further, I would like to acknowledge the country. In the spirit of reconciliation, BLOF acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to, the el to their elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Bluff is an initiative that intends to generate awareness, particularly among students and young people on biodiversity and conservation. In the second episode of this lecture series, we are privileged to have renowned paleontologist and conservationist, Professor Tim Flannery. Professor Flannery will be sharing insights on the topic, the history of monotremes. Born in Sandringham, Australia, Professor Tim, Tim Flannery is a leading figure in climate change advocacy. Initially, studying English at La Trobe University in 1977, he later shifted his focus to paleontology. Renowned for his expertise in fossil marsupials and mammal evolution, Professor Tim Flannery held various academic positions, including a professorial position at the University of Adelaide and director of the South, South Australian Museum. As the mammal curator at Australian Museum, he conducted groundbreaking surveys in Melanesia, identifying 17 previously unknown species, including several tree kangaroos. Alongside his academic pursuits, Professor Flannery is a prolific writer and presenter, known for his work on ABC Radio, NPR, and the BBC. He was honored as Australian of the Year in 2007 for his multifaceted contributions to science and conservation. Currently, Professor Tim Flannery holds a professorship at the University of Melbourne. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much, Dhruv. That was a lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here with you all. Um, I remember being a student myself and being absolutely fascinated with fossils. I was fortunate enough to go on some expeditions with the Museum of Victoria back in the 1970s, believe it or not, discovering fascinating fossils. So uh, I do encourage you all in your interest in, in paleontology and evolution. Um, Dhruv, could we have the, the uh, presentation? Thank you. So what I wanted to talk yes, to you- it is up. Is it up? Good. Excellent. Thank you. What I wanted to talk to the group about today is the evolution of one of the most intriguing groups of mammals in the world. Uh, they're called monotremes. There are only five living species of monotremes, which are the platypus, the common Australian echidna, and the three species of giant New Guinea long-beaked echidnas. Um, what makes them so special is that they have a number of characteristics which have been lost in other mammals, but which are present in reptiles and uh, some extinct groups. And that includes the fact that they lay eggs. It's highly unusual for any mammals to lay eggs. We're used to seeing birds laying eggs, but not mammals. So the monotremes are the last group that, that do that. They, are, they do feed their young with milk, although the females don't have breasts. They have uh, simple sweat-like glands in their chest that extrude milk out onto the, um, the belly of the, the mother and the young lick the milk from the furry, uh, the fur, furred belly of the mother. So they are very interesting creatures. They also have a kind of a primitive, uh, at least the echidnas are a primitive pouch-like structure. Um, in terms of their, their skeleton, they are really, there's, they're so different from the other mammals. They have a lot of very primitive features, things that we see in reptiles, but we don't see in other mammals. And they also have poisonous or venomous um, spurs on their hind limbs. 
again, very unusual among mammals. They're the only mammals to have such, uh, such a feature. And the venom is particularly toxic. Um, if you're stung by a platypus, a male platypus, um, you won't forget it. You, it, will, it will be painful sometimes for years on end. So they are the, the monotremes, just those five species. They're only found today in Australia and New Guinea. But their origins lay back at a distant period in Earth's past when the southern continents all formed a single landmass called Gondwana. And that name Gondwana comes from an Indian uh, group of people called the Gonds, and it was on their land in India that the first evidence was found of all of these continents being joined up. The continents uh, started breaking up around 120 million years ago uh, and continued on uh, through uh, through geological time. So let's have a look at uh, the next slide, Drew, if we could. So this is more of a technical slide. I apologize for those who are not absolutely riveted by monotreme evolution. But um, where do the monotremes come from? That's a very, very good question. And until quite recently, we had no idea from the fossil record uh, where they came from. People were making up various hypotheses based on the, what's called the morphology of the animal, the body form of the animal. One of the earliest ideas dating back to 1947 was that monotremes were somehow related to the marsupials. It sort of makes sense if you don't know much about these animals because marsupials and uh, monotremes are both found in Australia. Both have a pouch-like structure. So people thought maybe they're related. But it turned out that idea has been tested now genetically and in various other ways, and it's shown to be false. That is not correct. Other people think that the, um, the, the monotremes are somehow related to the earliest modern mammals, what are called the theria. And they include the ancestors of all of the marsupials, the pouched animals, as well as our own ancestors, the ancestors of the placental mammals. That idea is, again, rapidly falling out of favour as the fossil record reveals more discoveries. The best supported hypothesis at the moment is that the monotremes arose from a group of animals called dryolestids. And these are a primitive group of mammals that existed, um, or they really thrived, you know, more than 100 million years ago. And I should just digress here to explain to you that um, in, in geological terms, we think of the age of mammals as being from 66 million years ago to the present. And that age of mammals was triggered by the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh, mammals diversified rapidly and became the dominant vertebrate life form on the planet. But the story of the mammals is, is really quite different to that. For mammals first evolved 100 and 80 million years ago. So that is three times longer than the age of the mammals, just the last 66 million years. And most of the kind of fundamental diversity of mammals, in fact, evolved way back you know, 120 million years ago, or perhaps even as much as 180 million years ago. So the dryolestids were a group of now extinct mammals that had a lot of unusual features, some of which we're discovering are shared with the monotremes. The earliest dryolestids go back 180 million years. Um, they last until about 20 million years ago in, in South America. Uh, they're really quite widespread in the southern hemisphere, the southern continents, the Gondwanan fragments. So that sort of fits pretty well with what we know of, um, of, of a group that we expect the monotremes to have arisen from. But they are unknown from Australia. That is, of course, unless monotremes really are the living dryolestids. So we have the next slide. So this is what dryolestids and monotremes share in common. If you look at that jawbone on your left, that's a dryolestid jawbone. It's got, that one's got one, two, three, four, five, seven molars. Um, and one thing about dryolestids, they're pretty unique in having high molar numbers. We, uh, uh, modern mammals, that, that includes the both the marsupials and the placentals, have only three real molars each. Some 
marsupials have a premolar that looks like a molar, but it's not. It's actually uh, derived from a premolar series. So three molars for all of the modern mammals. Monotremes are sort of weird in that the earliest fossils we have of them have five molars. So that allies them with this group called Dryolestida, which that little jaw, as you, you can see there, which is only from an animal the size of a rat, uh, was from. And the molar shapes are sort of reminiscent. The upper molar shapes sort of reminiscent of half of a monotreme molar. Let's go on to the next, next slide. So where can we find fossils of monotremes that might enlighten us about this, this early phase of, of monotreme evolution? Most of the fossil sites are found in Australia. And here is a map showing you where they are. Um, these fossil sites vary in age from about 126 million years ago through to about 1 million years ago. So we'll have a look at some of the fossils produced from these sites now. But you can see there's a cluster in southern Australia, the very old sites and quite important sites, and then a scatter throughout the rest of the, the continent. And I should mention here that there are two kinds of monotremes being discovered recently in South America. We'll come to them a bit later. Okay, Drufu, let's have the next one. So you are looking at something very special on the left-hand side of this slide here, that little jawbone. It's only from an animal about the size of a small rat, but it is the earliest monotreme jawbone that we have ever found in the fossil record. It dates back to a time about 126 million years ago. It was found on the beach, in a rock on the beach in southern Victoria, just to the east of Melbourne. Um, and it's a terrible site to work. It gets, um, it's kind of below sea level now. So, you know, you've really got to put sandbag it and pump it out and dig in this, this rock that uh, is really, it's wet and muddy and difficult, sandy, difficult to work in. But you can see that jawbone there, it's got four molars, you can count, and then there's a little gap where one of the molars has fallen out. And it's got this really long and thin front bit of the jaw. And that tells us that the sort of beak-like structure that's so characteristic of the living monotremes was already in place um, in this very, very distant ancestor. One of the most interesting things about this fossil is that it's found, as I said, in southern Victoria. But back at the time that creature was alive, southern Victoria was well within the southern polar circle. It was at 76 degrees south. Now, if you go 76 degrees south today, you'll find nothing but ice. Um, back then, the world was a different place. Um, it was warmer, and the Antarctic continent was part of Gondwana, part of this much larger continent. And although it was cold in winter and dark for three months of the year, um, there was a lot of vegetation around. We know that from the fossils we find, uh, fossil plants we find with this uh, jawbone. We've found fossils of things that look like a Woolamai pine or an Araucaria, the, the monkey puzzle tree. Uh, we've found ginkgo leaves. We've even found primitive flowers in the rocks that date back to this, this particular time. Just very close to where this fossil was found, we've also found evidence of permafrost, where we know the, the surface must have frozen and um, it, it then has formed very characteristic shapes that have been preserved in the geology of the rocks. So a very cold environment, polar environment, but not totally frigid. There would have been a period of growth through the summer where the plants flourished and presumably this small monotreme um, thrived as well. We have the next next slide. So this is what the animal might have looked like in its environment. You can see it's it's only about the size of a, a shrew, you know, a size of a mouse really. Um, very very mossy environment. You can see some ice on the back of that boulder. There's a ginkgo leaf there. Um, big takeaway, of course, is a paleontologist love making illustrations like this. All we've got really is one upper molar and a jawbone to justify this. So, so take it with a grain of salt. But you can see it's got a sort of a, a naked snout, which is a reasonable uh, hypothesis. None of the monotremes have what are called vibrissae or whiskers. Um, and we know that it had electrosensitive, judging from the, the canals in the jaw, electrosensitive cells in that 
in that, that rostrum. So it presumably made a living probing in mossy, uh, mossy environments for invertebrates to eat. And sort of a pretty good solution if you're a small mammal that is living with three months of darkness a year. Having an electrosensitive sense lets you hunt totally in the dark uh, and find animals that are buried deeply in the moss. So that, as far as we know, is the beginning of the monotremes. It's very exciting to be able to, to see this because we haven't known this uh, for most of the time I was a scientist. This is quite new information. So let's fast forward from 126 million years ago through to about 110 million years ago, roughly. And what we find is that by this time, the monotremes had really changed. That tiny shrew-like species, there's nothing like that. Uh, 150, uh, sorry, 15 million years later, by the time we get to 110 million years ago. Instead, all of the monotremes we know about are sort of cat-sized animals. They've already become quite big and they've become very diverse. Um, we've only got a few fossils from this particular age group, but that number B, that molar there, is the molar of something, a monotreme that must have been, in terms of its diet, maybe a bit like a sea otter. It's eating some hard shelled thing that needs to be broken down um, with uh, very heavily enameled molars with these kind of complex patterns on them. Um, and, and this little limb bone here, Cryorictes number C there, is uh, another one of these uh, monotremes from this particular age. And these fossils are found um, just to the west of Melbourne. The first one we showed you was found to the east of Melbourne on the coast. These ones have been found to the west of Melbourne on the coast. And they're the result of unbelievable work. Dr. Tom Rich, who discovered these fossils, actually had to develop a mine on the most remote bit of cliff face in Victoria. Can you imagine making a mine there? He went in one morning and found that the mine had been flooded by a gigantic wave that had washed the compressors and generators and everything out to sea. They lost all of their equipment. It was a hair-raisingly dangerous place to be working uh, and using explosives and making a real mine to search for these fossils. Can we have the next slide, Andrew? Actually, we go, can we go back one? Um, go back, Drew, if we could. So just to show you the next group of fossils I want to talk about, date to about 100 million years ago, so about 10 million years after these ones we're just talking about. And these are the fossils you see on the far left of this slide. Can you see V, uh, number five and number six? See how they're... Those fossils have a greenish tinge to them. They are the fossil jaw bones of ancient monotremes that are preserved in opal, precious opal. It's a really extraordinary uh, process that has turned a, a bone into precious opal. These fossils are all found on the Lightning Ridge opal field in northern New South Wales. They are extremely rare and of course very, very valuable because they are made sometimes of precious opal. Um, probably, you know, for people who work on those opal fields, it's rare enough to find a piece of opal. Maybe one in a thousand pieces of rock you pick up is a piece of opal. Um, for it to be an opal fossil, it might be one in a hundred thousand that you find. For it to be an opal mammal fossil, it's like one in two million or something like that. They are very, very rare. But you see a selection of the, the fossils here on the far left. Um, they're, they all belong to this animal that looked, we think, a bit like, or must have behaved a bit like a sea otter in terms of using its very, very robust molars to crush something that had a hard shell. It was about the size of a cat. And uh, we have found three or four fossils of this animal now on the Lightning Ridge opal field. I'll go on to the next slide, if I could. So as we've chipped away at understanding of these opal fossils over now 40 years of, of work looking for fossils on the opal fields, we've discovered six different kinds of monotremes uh, among the opal fossils. And that's quite incredible. I mean, you know, what it tells us is that we are seeing a diversity of monotremes that hasn't existed before or since, that this really was the age of monotremes. 
And when you think about it, you know, in Australia today, we think of our land as the land of marsupials, yeah, kangaroos and possums and all the rest. But had we visited Australia as part of Gondwana 95 million years ago, it would have been all monotremes. We've found nothing but monotremes on the Lightning Ridge Opal Fields, despite the fact that they're unknown in the rest of the world. And I should just reinforce here that at the time these fossils lived, Lightning Ridge was within the polar circle. It was down below 60 degrees south. And um, so were the other sites that we mentioned earlier that have produced opal fossils. So up to this point of 100 million years ago, all of the monotremes we know about were living within the south polar circle. That's kind of interesting, a point we'll come back to soon. In terms of these families and monotremes we've listed here, I just want you to notice the bottom one there that says Ornithorhynchid, Daragara, that is an ancestor of the platypus. And it's the first time we see something really like a platypus in the fossil record. Uh, what's really astonishing about it is that from what we can tell about its molar row, the molars of the, the, the platypus and ancestors had hardly changed for 95 million years. You know, juvenile platypus still have teeth, adults lack them, um, they have horny plates instead, but that's an incredibly long period of time for uh, stasis, what we call stasis, or very little change in the fossil record. You know, our ancestors back then would have been like little rat-like creatures. You know, we've changed, our lineage has changed a lot, but the platypus hardly changed at all. So let's go on to the next slide. So this is where we find these fossils at Lightning Ridge. If you ever get a chance to go out there, uh, you stand a, a slim chance, but a chance of finding uh, a monotreme fossil. You, all you need to do is walk over the ground out there and look where people have tipped out all of their, what they call their waste or their, their, the dirt from the opal fields. They quite often overlook opals. And uh, many of the fossils we've found have been picked up by people just walking over the old tailings, the old tailings, the, the throwaway material that the opal miners have left behind. So there it is, there's Lightning Ridge up near the border with Queensland and there's a little detailed map of the sort of places that um, we'll be talking about uh, for the next couple of slides. So I'm letting you in now on a bit of a secret because this, the publication of these fossils uh, is pending. The, the, the manuscript has been um, submitted reviewed and returned to the journal, but as yet we haven't heard it's been accepted, although I expect to hear that in the next few days. But I just want to show you what some of these fossils actually look like and um, why they're so interesting. So this Opelios splendens, just this, uh, we'll go back to, sorry, um, if we could, uh, it's, a, it's a jawbone of an animal and you can see on, probably on the left better, we're looking down at the top of the jawbone there, we can see the little alveoli the teeth would have fitted into. Can you see that in A and B there? Um, and the most interesting thing to note about this is that this animal has five molars. One, two, three, four, five. You can see all of the alveoli for them. And also that its dentary is twisted. You can see how it's sort of like, um, like this front bit is twisted relative to the back bit. That's very characteristic of the monotreme, of the, um, sorry, the, the platypus group of organisms. So this is an ancient and distant relative, relative of the platypus. The two, G and H, those things you see there, they are CT scans of the front of the jaw that reveal that this animal had the same sort of canals in its jaws that the modern platypus has for its electrosensitive capacity. So we can see that that electrosensitive uh, ability was present even in this distant ancestor. And this animal is about the size of a modern platypus. We've only got the one jaw. Um, see how it's in pieces? It was found over a number of months on the one opal tailings heap. The person who found it found one bit uh, and then was so excited they went back and found another. Then their mother came and looked and found the remaining two bits over months. Um, it's a, just fantastic that we have this fossil because uh, it's so informative about the early origins of the platypus. And it wouldn't have happened without just the hard work of uh, Liz and Clyte Smith, who live out at Lightning Ridge. So let's have a, a look at the next ones. So I was so impressed with Clyte's work that we ended up naming a fossil after her. She's a very determined young lady, and Palo, uh, Parvo Palace Clytei on the right there 
is a really weird monotreme. We, we think it might be related to a thing called Sauropodon, but that question mark tells you we don't really know. But it's definitely a monotreme, and it's the smallest one that we've found on the Lightning Ridge opal fields. Um, on the left, we see the jaw of this platypus-like thing. I mean, you know, those that setup of the teeth there with the three molars and the third molar being so tiny, and then all of the, the little premolars at the front is absolutely characteristic of the living juvenile platypus. Nothing much has changed over time. So that is really interesting. I don't think I've covered this in this um, presentation, so I might just mention it here. Can any of you think about why the platypus might have lost its teeth after having the same, basically the same set of chompers for 100 million years or thereabouts? Why would it lose its teeth? It's a question that we thought about, as co-authors of this paper, long and hard. Um, and the only thing we can think of that makes any sense is that another species got into the Australian environment and started to compete with the platypus for hard shelled food. And that species we think is the Australian water rat. Uh, it's an animal, it's, it's, a, it's a rodent, like a rat, member of the rat family. They weigh about a kilo, they're carnivorous, and they eat things like shrimps and uh, mussels and other hard shelled food. They arrive about 2 million years ago, and we think the platypus may have lost its teeth 2 million years ago as it evolved to eat softer and more slippery prey. So the little kind of um, pads in its jaw today are much better at manipulating and holding and processing soft, slippery prey than the harder prey that perhaps the ancestral platypus uh, would have eaten. But it's amazing to think that that ecological displacement has happened so relatively recently. Go ahead, Druva. Yep. So I mentioned that monotreme fossils have been found in South America. Well, here they are. Here's pretty much everything we have. Um, on the left, we have a fossil that dates to the very end of the age of dinosaurs from Patagonia. And on the right, that A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, are a few teeth found from the earliest stage of the age of mammals in South America. So these date from about 75 million to about 63 million years ago. So why did monotremes get into South America? When did they get there? What kind of monotremes got there? They're all questions that are still very much, uh, what would I say, uh, under investigation. So far, we have evidence only for platypus-like monotremes getting into South America at this time. We know that about 90 million years ago, the Earth's climate warmed up quite considerably, and we know that the flowering plants that had evolved in Australia got into South America at that time, quite a number of them, and we suspect that the monotremes may have also kind of traipsed their way across Antarctica during this brief warming period, got into South America, flourished there for about 15 million years, and then became extinct. But it is fascinating to think that uh, monotremes are also in, were in South America, platypus-like monotremes, um, and they must have been in Antarctica as well, but we're yet to find any fossils of, uh, of these groups in Antarctica. So here's what any of you who are budding paleontologists out there, your ears should prick up at this. We have no fossils of monotremes between 63 and 26 million years ago. So this is what I call the horrid blank. We have to fill this blank in if we're to have a proper understanding of uh, what happened to the monotremes because we just don't know. This is, this is completely a global blank. Um, uh, 26 million years ago, we'll show you what some of the fossils look like, but it's important to note here that the marsupials arrive in Australia from South America around about 54 million years ago. Uh, so it would be fascinating to know what Australia was like before the marsupials arrived. Was there a pre-existing diversity of monotremes that went extinct in competition with the marsupials? Or did the monotremes go extinct at the time of the dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago? We just don't know. Thanks, Drew. So by the time we get to 26 million years ago, we start seeing really recognisable uh, monotremes. This skull is from uh, the Riversley World Heritage Fossil Deposits. It's about 14 million years old, and it clearly represents a platypus. There's no doubt about that. This is 
totally modern platypus. Um, so a few of the takeaways here is that these animals by now, by, by 26 million years ago, let's say, had become recognizably like platypus. The journey from that Opelius-like creature through to this remains a mystery because we don't have the fossils to document it. But it's important to, to understand that these fossils from 26 million years ago, they're the earliest non-polar monotremes. So this is the first time we find any monotreme fossils outside those South Polar environments. And that's sort of important because um, in most mammal groups are pretty global in their distribution, at least at this higher level of orders and so forth. Um, but the monotremes, they are really been Australian and South American their whole history, and we think that might be because they were so adapted for those polar environments. It seemed to take them a long time to adapt to warmer environments. And as I said, the earliest evidence we have of this is 26 million years ago. So let's move on to the next slide. So you might have noticed there's one group of monotremes that I haven't been talking about at all so far, and that are these animals here, the echidnas. So some of you will have seen the Australian echidna, hopefully it's a pretty, it's not a common animal, but it's very widespread and driving Australian roads, you know, September, October, when these animals are very active, you're likely to see an echidna on the side of the highway. This particular one you're looking at here is a long beaked echidna from New Guinea. These animals are giants. They can weigh up to 16 kilograms and be a metre long. They don't eat um, uh, termites, as the Australian uh, echidna does, or ants. These things eat worms. And that beak is, you know, this long, very long. Why haven't I mentioned the tachyglossids or the echidna lineage up to this point? Because they don't have a fossil record. And that is extremely interesting. We know from their genetics that they separated by at least 50 million years ago from the platypuses. They may go back much further than that. We just don't know. But perhaps up to 70, 80 million years ago. Um, so where are they? We'll have a look at the next slide. So the earliest echidna fossils we've got date just to the Pleistocene, the last 0.8 or 800,000 to 1.7 million years ago. They come from a site in Victoria. You know, echidna bones, they're, they're reasonably big. They're very robust. They don't break down very easily. If echidnas were around, I'm convinced that they'd be in the Australian fossil record. They're just not there. And that makes us all wonder, where were they? Where have they been evolving all of this time? So our hypothesis we have at the moment is that they evolved initially in New Guinea, where these giant long-beaked echidnas live today, specifically in this part of New Guinea. This is what's called the bird's head or the very western end of the island of New Guinea. Uh, it's a part of the ancient Australian craton. Um, so the rocks there are very much like Australian rocks. They're quite different to the rocks in the rest of, of New Guinea. And this area has been above water, we think, for at least 55 million years, if not longer. We also have evidence that there was faunal interchange between this kind of ancient fragment of the Australian Craton and the rest of Australia around about 2 million years ago maybe two to three million years ago. Maybe that's when the echidnas got into Australia. We'll have a look at the next slide. So that's a very provocative hypothesis yet to be tested. The thing I love about the hypothesis though is it's easily tested to be wrong. A single fossil of an echidna older than two million years or three million years would prove us wrong. So it's good in science to put out hypotheses that are easily testable. That's, we can, you know, as you all know, in science, we can never prove anything, um, but we can disprove things. That's the way science moves forward. And this is a hypothesis that's easily disproved, as all scientific hypotheses should really be. So I just want to talk a little bit about, sorry, go back to that slide, uh, the last two million years in Australia and what's happened to the, to the monotremes. Um, it's really been a bit of a golden age 
for the monotremes over that period. Um, the, the platypus uh, has remained widespread in Eastern Australia, even though it's lost its teeth. It's, uh, it's found a successful niche for itself and has survived into the present, even in competition with the water rat. And just as an aside, I should say that just last year, if you go online, you'll be able to see this on YouTube, someone filmed a fight between a female platypus and a water rat. And I would have said that the water rat would win, win every time. They've got the most wicked stabbing incisor teeth that you've ever seen. They're amazing. They can do a lot of damage. Um, the platypus has no teeth and females don't even have a poisonous spur. And yet after a 10 minute struggle, have a guess who won? The platypus did. And it did so by drowning the water rat, believe it or not. Uh, so platypus physiology may have won out. They may have that slow metabolic rate and that ability to survive without breathing underwater for a considerable period might have uh, uh, been told the difference. Interestingly, the, the platypus that was fighting that water rat seemed to have been carrying two eggs near her tail, which is an unusual thing. Maybe the water rat was trying to eat the eggs of the echidna and that precipitated the fight. Anyway, on the other side there, the echidnas, um, once those echidnas got into Australia, they really started to diversify. We've found fossils of species very much like the New Guinean long-beaked echidna uh, throughout eastern and, and southern Australia. In the southwest of Australia, we had a gigantic echidna, twice the size of anything else. Um, and there it is standing up there. Um, its legs suggest that it was either uh, able to stand up like that or may have even been able to climb trees. And that's a fascinating thought. Can you imagine an echidna weighing 30 kilograms climbing up into the treetops? Seems unlikely, but giant echidnas are very capable climbers. I have, when I've worked in New Guinea, I've had some captive and I've built a, a big fenced area to keep them in and they've very easily climbed the fence and got out. Um, it's interesting that in the southwest of WA, um, the termite that the echidnas tend to eat, a thing called coptotermes, it's tree dwelling. It's the only part of Australia where that particular termite lives up in the treetops. And maybe it's not so uh, strange to think that, um, that that gigantic echidna that evolved in the southwest may have been feeding on uh, these coptotermes, these uh, colonial termites. The common Australian echidna, the short-beaked echidna, of course, a great success story. It is the most widely distributed of all of the Australian mammals. It's found everywhere from the central deserts to the highlands of Tasmania. Um, very, very adaptable creature, uh, doing very well despite the fact that it lays eggs and looks a bit primitive. Um, part of that we think is due to the large brain of these monotremes. You might think because they're primitive mammals, they lay eggs, that they're a bit stupid. They're not at all. Their, their brains are the most complex brains um, and particularly the fore part of the brain of, of uh, any Australian mammal. They're much more complex and larger brain than the marsupials. Uh, and they have the sort of the same um, frontal lobes uh, that we humans have. That, you know, if it was just a matter of size and architecture of the brain telling you what was going on, you'd think they'd be great thinkers. Uh, and I do think that we underestimate them because they're, all of the monotremes have this beak, this rubbery beak that really masks any emotions that they're feeling. They can't we can't read in their face uh, any, any of the thought processes going on. And yet I know they're extremely smart because these giant echidnas in New Guinea I've worked with, uh, they soon get to know you and remember you. Um, I remember there was one particular long-beaked echidna that I um, rescued from some hunters um, years and years ago, um, put it into a zoo in, in Papua New Guinea. I went and visited it a decade later to film it and the animal came right up to me and put its long beak down my boot and I could feel its tongue tickling my toes. It definitely remembered me <laughs> from, from all of those years ago. So they are fascinating animals. Um, we, we, I've only touched on the story of their evolution here. There's so much more uh, to know, but um, I thought it was worthwhile uh, sharing what we do know to date with you. So I'm happy to open the floor to questions, Drew, if you wish. Yep, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat box. You can unmute and ask uh, Professor yourself. No, oh, I'd like to start if anyone doesn't have any questions. I wanted to know about, uh, how we know that the water rat, as you said, uh, you know, got introduced to the Australian ecosystem all that while back. 
is there a possibility that like evolve to be in australia or is it definitely an outsider it's definitely an outsider we we know from genetic studies that the water rat originated in new guinea mm. um the group of aquatic rats that must have originally come from asia but got into new guinea eight million years ago or so diversified in the mountains of new guinea and then during the ice ages our sea levels fell linking australia and new guinea again beginning about two million years ago and the water rat was the one lineage of those large aquatic rodents that managed to get into australia and it spread uh, quite quickly and we find its fossils through that pleistocene period um, if it wasn't the water rat that caused the platypus to lose its teeth, then we're struggling for another explanation. <laughs> it's very, very yeah. peculiar because after nearly 100 million years of stability with that dental formula, it clearly was very successful. Why would it all of a sudden lose its molars just uh, in the last bit of time? So do you think it could be owing to the climate change that could have ha happened? Yeah. It's, it's possible that maybe something about the ice age environment changed uh, the, the food preference of the platypus but it's not very evident as to what that might be after all the water rat eats the same sort of hard shelled foods that the ancestral platypus could have eaten with its molars so the food source is still there it's just being exploited by a different different organism okay uh Stephen has a question there was one, I saw one flashed up on the chat, but I, it's vanished into the... That's the one. I'm sorry. Um, could you read that question out, perhaps, because I'm not being able to see yep. it. Uh, sure. Uh, Stephen says, seems one way migration from PNG to Australia and via Antarctica to South America. Is this the right or was the migration two ways? So the migration of monotremes from Australia into South America was one way as far as we know. There are four different families of monotremes in Australia uh, in the kind of latter part of the age of dinosaurs. Only one of those lineages gets into South America. So it appears later in South America and it's just one lineage. And that suggests that the group was diversifying for a long time in Australia before a pathway opened up for one very specialised group of monotremes to get into South America. So I think that was one way. Oh. Um, in the case of New Guinea and Australia, that's again a fascinating question. Um, and it's possible, you know, we were talking about the water rat before. There are three different genera of large carnivorous aquatic rats in the mountains of New Guinea. So it's possible that platypus may have tried to invade that habitat, but were simply outcompeted by those rodents. We, we'll, we don't know that because we haven't got any fossils, but it's one possibility. Um, in terms of the echidnas, we know that the echidnas must have arrived in Australia sometime in the Pleistocene in the last two million years or so. Um, and the hypothesis is they came from the Vogel Cop in New Guinea into Australia. Um, but later on in the Pleistocene, as sea levels dropped and um, land bridges opened, the Australian short-beaked echidna did back migrate into New Guinea. So it's found today in the drier parts of southeastern New Guinea. So there's been quite a lot of movement uh, around through those, uh, those regions. Okay. Uh, following up with that, uh, like you said, the platypus may have invaded uh, uh, New Guinea and may have gotten outcompeted. Uh, do you think it also the difference in the gestation period between the water rat and the platypus? Yes, the gestation period, I'd have to double check on that. But the water rat has more offspring, more young, for sure. Mm -hmm. We'd have litters of probably three or four. Platypus have uh, two, typically, occasionally three. And of course, they are, they are born as eggs uh, and then become what's called puggles. They become these little tiny naked things kept in a burrow and the mother has to go back and feed them. Um, so there may be a difference in reproductive rate. You're quite right. Okay. It's interesting, just in terms of platypus dwarf there, 
you know, the male platypus would have no trouble seeing off a water rat because they have these very long spines, about two centimetres long, nastily curved, a bit like a snake's uh, fang. And they are capable of injecting a venom, which is basically a pain invoking venom. So it just makes, it gives you extreme pain. Um, they, they've never been proved fatal to people, although they have very severe impacts, but they can certainly kill smaller mammals. Um, but oh, the females yeah. lack those spines altogether, like, like that venom altogether. I think my dad has a question. Yeah. Can, can I, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, yeah, yeah. yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Professor Flannery, for this uh, wonderful, very clear and very, very interesting, intriguing presentation. So, so much so that even a dim-witted a social scientist like me get uh, get interested in this topic. And I have two questions, uh, naive questions rather. One is uh, is uh, taking inspiration from the comment uh, made by Charles Darwin on, on his first arrival, two distinct creators must be at work. Uh, uh, so what might be the reason that only these two geographic regions, South America and Australia, have uh, this uh, this very interesting creatures with with a pouch uh, around their belly and associated numerous uh, uh, you know adaptations uh, uh, related to childbirth and nurturing. That is one thing. Secondly, uh, uh, just provoked by your 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 mention about uh, platypus's uh, brain size and its its uh, its specialities and. It being a very uh, potentially very intelligent creature, uh, do you think there is a correlation between the evolutionary time uh, and the size of the brain? Uh, because we see kind of stupid animals uh, everywhere and very intelligent, very small creatures everywhere. So, what is the correlation between the time, brain size, and perceived intelligence? Look, they're, they're both great questions. To do them justice, I'd almost have to give you two more lectures, but could I? So I'll have to deal with them a little bit quickly. Um, so, in terms of the zoogeography of the regions, why are these animals found in Australia? Um, as we've heard, um, back at the time the earliest monotremes lived, Australia was part of a supercontinent called Gondwana, which included India, Africa, South America, and Antarctica. Um, and that continent broke up over time. But the, the kind of core of the continent was Antarctica. And the Antarctic environment has always been difficult. The continent has sat over the South Pole for a long time. So even during periods of relative warmth, there was three months of darkness and a very distinctive environment, presumably, over that continent. And we think that that particular environment acted as a filter allowing only very, very few species to cross. And it was only in times of extreme warmth, like 90 million years ago, and then again at 54 million years ago, that some species could make the crossing from one to the other. So Australia was sort of almost a cul-de-sac off the side of, um, once India left 120 million years ago, off the side of Antarctica. So there was only one way in and out, which was across this Antarctic continent. And that gave the Australian fauna a very distinctive character because we weren't right over the South Pole. We were in some more temperate areas, but in order to access the continent, we had to, our species had to cross this very formidable barrier. So that's, in a nutshell, the situation with zoogeography. In terms of brain size, this is something I've been very interested in for a long time. And it seems to me there is a correlation between longevity and brain size. After all, um, larger brains give you the potential to develop a culture if you want. We, uh, the adults can learn things that are passed on to the young. And echidnas are very long-lived animals. We've, we've, people have kept uh, the long-beaked echidnas in New Guinea in captivity for 60 years. So animals that were captured as adults 60 years ago, still alive in a zoo after all that time. Um, so we don't know how long they live in the wild. They could well live a century. We just, we just don't know. But I suspect that they um, have developed that large brain uh, in part 
because they are long lived and can learn through life and that large brain is is worth paying the cost of because obviously there's a metabolic cost for having a, a large brain smaller animals that are shorter lived that don't have that ability to uh, pass on knowledge to the next generation to the same extent often get by with lesser brains and marsupials by the way are probably have the smallest brains on average of all of the um, all of the mammals uh, and and the monotremes which probably have the largest brains on average of all of the mammals just happen to share the one continent thank you professor flandry uh steve nelman has another question about the future of monotremes yeah look the monotremes are on on a, on a rise at the moment um after some thin times in the past, um, just over the Pleistocene or the very last epoch of time, um, they're doing pretty well. You know, the platypus, yes, it has, there are some threats to it, but if we address those threats as humans, such as water pollution and so forth, uh, they'll do okay, I think. The, the giant echidnas in New Guinea, they have been under hunting pressure uh, by people, but again, um, there's various initiatives in New Guinea, and I've been involved in some uh, to give them protection. And where that uh, is effective, they do very well. The short-beaked echidna is Australia's great mammal success story. It's, it's, as I said, it's found in every habitat from the deserts to the, the alpine snowfields of Tasmania. It's an amazing survivor. So um, if we take the long evolutionary view and look out 10 or 20 million years, I wouldn't be surprised to see the monotremes actually doing quite well. Thank you, Professor Flamery. Uh, I must add that uh, Stephen is my teacher that I told you about. Yeah. He's a big fan of your book, The Future It Is. Oh. Yeah, he told me about it in class. So thank you, Stephen, for being here. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that's it. I assume that nobody else has any, has any questions. I think we come to the end of the lecture. Thank you so much, Professor, for such a nice lecture. I, I especially liked it. It was very entertaining. It was very interesting. Right. Thank you, Drew. It's a bit hard with a group of animals that not everyone is very familiar with, but uh, I'm very glad you enjoyed it. And I just hope that I've inspired someone out there to, uh, to add to that fossil record. We, we need to, you know, there's so much more to learn. Uh, it'd be tremendous to think that someone listening today uh, might be inspired to go out and discover the next critical monotreme fossil. Uh, you've definitely inspired me. I'll try my best. Great. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Stephen says, lightning rage, here I come. Yeah, great. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. You're Thank you, very Professor. Kind. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, thank you to everyone.